today by Diddy Pursehouse. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. That's perfect, yes. Oh, good, good, even without <laughs> my best Vermont accent. Actually, so, most of the purse houses in the world are in Australia. They're, oh, they're okay. almost none of them. It's just me and my brothers and sisters here. So, and, But and you've got purse house caves and purse house this and purse house that. Wow. Oh, that's so. incredible. Well, <laughs> have you been down here before? Not yet, no. Well, uh, we've got a lot to talk about today. Um, there's a lot of questions um, that you've been able to give to us. As a lot of people know, I ask people to to um, to give me a list of questions because I because one I'm very lazy and two um, it gives people an opportunity to uh, to to put forward the things that um, really account for where they want to take all of this conversation. So um, so with that um, I'm going to you know, hang on what am I doing here? Uh, I'm going to get this up and bigger. You can't use it. Yeah. It's making my connection. <laughs> Just got to tell my son to get off the internet. I know. Get off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hang on. I'll just get that. Why isn't that as large as it could be? Okay. So, um, You've had a pretty incredible life. Um, I, was, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was reading your, your fantastic book um, here, um, The Ecology of Care, which I can only recommend to everyone because it is quite a yarn apart from everything else. I don't have to know what the yarn means, but a really yes. good story. Yes. Good. Yes. And um, how did you, how did you come to the place of writing that? Um, Cause it's a, uh, it's, it's quite a life that you've had and uh, quite an upbringing and all the rest of it. So what brought to the, you to the point where you would write where it? Where I wanted to write it all down. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I've been a, I've been, been a writer all along, so that, that wasn't really a new piece, but, it, but um, hadn't ever written anything long. And uh, in 2006, I guess, I had been, uh, I'd been practicing alternative health care since 1995, I think, maybe, maybe 93. And, um, and 2006, I actually was at a uh, an expo where they had alternative medicine on one floor and they had uh, sustainable living on another floor. And those were the only two themes of this expo. And I thought, huh, that's funny. Those seem they seem like they go together, but what it, what is the link there? And and I was going to have a table there the next morning uh, for the clinic that I ran, which was five of us who practiced alternative medicine. And uh, I started thinking about about those links, and I started thinking, would sustainable medicine be? And um, and I wrote up a, a manifesto that night. Uh, but you did you didn't you couldn't get U, URL though I read. Someone had already stolen them. On the <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else already had sustainablemedicine.org. I think I got sustainablemedicine.net. So I got up and running. <laughs> but, uh, I think .net sometimes should be .next because it's often that the next one you get that, on the That's line. right. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the manifesto was putting together this idea about sustainability in healthcare. And I actually originally started it calling it eco the ecological medicine manifesto which i've come full circle back to because at that point sustainable was sort of a word that was interesting and exciting mm -hmm. now everybody turns up their noses at the word sustainable and i'm sure regenerative is next on the list no, it will be. <laughs> already is. I'm, already, I'm already dissing it yeah <laughs> i don't know what i'll go for next but anyway right um so so I called it then the Ecological Medicine Manifesto, and it was really looking at whole systems and how that our health is very much interconnected with the health of the rest of everything else that lives on the planet, and uh, and and how you know, and that the way that we practice medicine and the way that we care for ourselves should also be in line with that, because obviously, if we if we don't think about those things. No. We're sort of shooting ourselves in the foot when we try to practice healthcare or care for ourselves or each other. No. So that was the that that night that sort of all gelled into one piece, and I thought, huh, this is something that I'd like to 
devote more time to. So I started writing at that point uh, a book called Sustainable Medicine, which turned into this book, The Ecology of Care, over time as I as I learned more and more. And the things kept happening. You know, it started off sort of generally thinking thinking about environmental impact of healthcare, thinking about ways of caring for each other that were low carbon. Or, yeah. Um, they're actually, and, and at that point, I was mostly interested in peak oil. Yeah. Um, and intrigued by the transition town movement and reskilling, and so I saw I saw acupuncture and homeopathic medicine and herbal medicine and um, peer counseling and things like that as as kind of forms of reskilling in medicine that we that could be shared widely. Mm-hmm. So, but then 2011 Hurricane Irene slammed mm-hmm. into Vermont. And uh, I hadn't been that interested in climate change. I kind of felt like, well, other people are working on climate change. That's not my thing. And Vermont's going to be, what's, who cares if Vermont gets a little warmer? Because <laughs> 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 we're always too cold here. So, <laughs> so but, but we, our, our rivers really um, just exploded. And we, we lost hundreds of miles of roads and bridges and, and I've always been interested in water That's yep. right from the day I was born. I think we all are. Yeah. And so that, that was a turning point in, for me to think about the impact of water on landscapes. And I basically couldn't think about anything else from then on. And then that, uh, so it turned that the, was turned the carbon genie on. Yeah. So then, so that was 2011. And so then the book took on this whole piece around climate change um, and what is the impact of climate change on health and what is the impact again, healthcare and climate. So not just environment, but climate specifically. Mm-hmm. And then I stumbled into Judy Schwartz's book, Cows Save the Planet and Other Improbable Ways of Restoring Soil to Heal the Earth is the uh, subtitle. Judy, Judy's in Vermont as well, isn't she? She, or is. Up there, yeah. she is. Yeah. So her book was in a bookstore near here. Yeah. And and I read that and I got about halfway through and I said, Oh, this is what I want to do with the second half of my life. Yeah. And and that was it. That was it. I mean, literally the next day I got on the phone and said, Who's doing this? Who can I meet? Yeah. And within within a couple of months I basically completely shifted towards that. So <laughs> <laughs> my kids are like, What's next? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and you've got two boys, so um, and they've had quite a journey as well, being with you being their mother and uh, with the family that you have, and you're a single mother yeah. as well, so you've been that for a long time. Yeah, their, their dad lives up the hill, though, but we're a sing, single parent household here. So yeah, yeah. We send them back and forth up and down yeah. the hill. Great. <laughs> yeah. um, I was really intrigued in reading your book um, about something I felt resonated with me quite a lot because it was kind of similar that when you, when you were um, working as an acupuncturist, as a therapist, you were able to assess a person um, straight up by their, by their smell, by the, and by all of these, I, um, you talked about the, the blind acupuncturists mm-hmm. um, that you were trained by in Japan. And uh, that was the, that's, I, I never heard of that before. And um we, we use an acupuncturist that, who was chi- uh, trained in the Chinese method here in Bendigo, and yeah. um, he's fantastic, but he certainly doesn't do it blind. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking about his treatment and um, how he tests our pulse and he looks at our tongue and things that you were talking about, but you you seemed to go a bit further with that, and it, was, it kind of reminded me of how I go into landscapes and it is a smell thing and you know, yeah. you, it's, it's a very sensory thing and um, your, your therapy of the human body um, seemed to take on a, a similar sort of approach. And I, you know, I think Darren, that's, that, that is a key piece of working with systems that if you're working on a systems level, you, all of your senses should be involved, right? Mm-hmm. Because if they aren't, what are you missing? That's part of the system. Mm-hmm. So I've just finished reading um, the Dorito effect. Do you know that book? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, it's a wonderful book. It's about it's nutrient other, density. That's a great yeah, title. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's about nutrient density of foods and what's happened to the nutrition based on soils. And it's a lot A lot of it's based on Fred Provenza's work. Oh, right. Okay. And, and um, 
but yeah, but he's all about that, that our, you know, our whole system is tuned to, to go after healthy systems and, and our senses are very much involved in that and, yeah. and that we need to trust them, except that, except that some corporations have figured out how to over, override our, our sensory. Yeah. Well, especially uh, the, I've only heard this anecdotally, but um, a lot of people have suggested that uh, that fast food or modern food, if you like, um, affects the taste buds quite a lot, and that's one of the first things that comes back, and all of that um, as yeah. a result of, of a shift from, to more uh, whole foods. Yeah. So yeah, one of the things he said that was intriguing to me, and I've been noticing it, is that if you eat a diet, if you eat a meal that is truly nutrient dense, you know, really great pasture finished meat etc and veggies grown in a no-till system etc that that it's not you may notice a difference in the taste but it's how you feel an hour or two later that you have this deep sense of satisfaction and that's yeah. how you know that that you're, you're because he says you're t basically your taste buds i don't know if it's literally taste buds but they're they go through your whole system yeah so your body knows whether it's getting the nutrients or not yeah whether you're chewing as well, um, because it yes. all starts with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you've got um, quite a list of questions here. Um, and so I might just start going through some of those. Um, let's talk about Walter Jenner first. Um, your, uh, who's, a, who's a, even in our country is not that well known and uh, yeah. someone that you've, it seems like you've hooked up with the stars straight up in your journey. Um, <laughs> you know, Judy Schwartz um, and, and uh, Peter Donovan and, and characters like that who are, you know, people at the top of their game and Walter Jenner, who even in our country is, uh, which is where he's from is not that well known. Um, tell yeah. us about how you yeah. his, came to, his came name to, is pronounced his, his name is very hard to pronounce from us. It's it's actually Yena, as if Yena. the first. Well, of course. As if it was a Y, yeah. <laughs> I've so, not met him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you would love him. We're, we're, we're going to get him on, actually, in a few yeah, weeks. I think, yeah, right? I'm very much looking forward yeah, to that. Yeah. And, um, a gem. And, well, um, we, and I looked at his website, and he had photos of me on his website, so I thought, well, we, we must be meant oh, to be some sort. So Walter was here. Um, speaking at a conference at Tufts University in 2015 um, that, and it was, the conference was all about um, restoring global water cycles basically. Yeah. yeah. And um, that was a phenomenal conference. There were so many interesting speakers. Uh, and, and, uh, and I actually had already jumped in the year before my goal originally when I, when I realized I wanted to work in this, general area of soil health mm -hmm. was to put together that I was learning that I wanted to, to write learning resources for other people right. um, because of a that's as I bet you know that's the yeah. best way to learn is when yeah, you teach yeah. yeah and secondly I figured I'm I'm starting at ground zero here I know nothing about this um, I know lots about systems but I don't know about this system so I know how to approach systems but I don't know this system. So I, if I track my learning progress, it's probably going to be a pretty good progress because I know how to go about it and I'm going to figure out what are the, what's the, what are the building blocks of information. So I did that and I started testing it out with different people, teaching, teaching in high schools and teaching at conferences and doing whatever I, you know, I'm the kind of person who uh, one week into learning something, I want to turn around and teach you to give a talk. <laughs> um, well, some people are natural at that, so that's which is fine. Well, it's, I, 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 as I said, I, I learn a lot by trying to figure out how to explain it because then I have yeah. to go look it up. So, well, wait, I really don't understand that yet. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I had two high school students who had done a, a core, like a six week course with me, and I had them go up and do a presentation at this conference, I asked the, the organizers, could they do it? And that's actually where this bread and flour thing, which maybe we'll do a little later, that's yeah. now gone kind of all over the world. Christine Jones, I guess, uses, uses that video. Yeah. So, so they, they did that little experiment there. And all these people like Walter and Christine and Michael Kravchik, et cetera, just went, 
oh god because it was exactly what they've been trying to explain for day you know for hours and hours and hours and this one little visual helped them helped everybody kind of went oh that's what we're talking about yeah. so so walter was very taken with that demo and we got talking and he gave a, a fantastic but very very short talk that really wet my appetite but it wasn't enough and then somebody said to me oh walter needs you know he wants to tour around a little bit would you be interested in bringing him up to vermont and i said yeah of course so so i brought him up and i just had you know had my tape recorder and pen and paper going the entire time for maybe three days we were together <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then and and then he became part of my book the ecology of care so that his some of his stuff around nutrient density of foods and the soil sponge got in there and it became a big part of the teaching materials that i was doing uh because again that was sort of a shift from thinking really just about soil carbon and atmospheric carbon to, th to think about water as soon as yeah. water gets involved i'm i'm in you know yeah. <laughs> so 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 that so so then he, then someone invited both of us to speak at a conference and he said, well, if, if you're speaking there, I don't need to speak there because you and I are talking about the same things. And he said, I'll, I'll coach you if you need any, any more details. And so that kind of became the beginning of our real working mm -hmm. relationship. And then he said, cause I'm going to be there six months later. So that was last year. And I got, so last year, I got him here for maybe 10 days and we'd put on a four day conference together. And, and again, I had the tape recorder and the video camera and the pen and paper and, <laughs> and he's just, the information just flows. My son said, well, he gets up in the morning, you know, we come out, we come downstairs from bed and Walter's sitting there and talking. And when we go to bed at night, he's still talking. Yeah. <laughs> he's just, and it's, it's all new, you know, and it's, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. He's a, a, a classic Australian storyteller. Yes, and and decades of science with the CSIRO yeah. and and lots of other places too. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, no, he has a, a, an incredible pedigree. So you've got workshops coming up um, this year in um, in California and in Vermont. So uh, so I'll be with him in California and Vermont and uh, and in Massachusetts. And then he's doing also a two-day conference in Ohio. Um, and he and Judy are speaking in Kansas. I'll be there with them. But yep. uh, And then he's also doing some stuff up in um, Saskatchewan and Ontario, Canada. Fantastic. Oh, we'll have to um, – so, well, we'll get all of those details up so people can yep. follow, follow you guys around, all you people around. So – the water thing is obviously interesting to me um, as a key liner. Um, yes. That's my sort of first um, methodology, first. having grown up on a key line farm. Um, oh, okay. To an extent, uh, my grandfather developed all of the water systems on our farm, but he didn't take care of the soil at all um, mm -hmm. to the extent, um, I don't know if I've told people this before, but I did a soil test, an Albrecht-based soil test there a few years before the farm was sold and I'd done thousands of these tests um, and this was by far the worst, had the worst numbers of anything and I was like, oh, <laughs> I knew it was bad. I didn't know it was that bad. <clears throat> it was a clay loam soil but it had a lower cation exchange capacity than sand. Wow. Yeah, which I don't know how you do that but <laughs> I was sort of going, do I need to do this again? Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yes, it's um, uh, the water thing is a really incredible one, and what we've seen with so many projects having um, applied the whole key line pathway to it, um, that uh, that the control of water is so much greater. The marine carbon project um, is one that uh, we had a early involvement with um, in instigating it um, when Abe Collins, another. Vermont man. Um, yeah, and also Vermont. on our board. Yeah, he's part yeah. of our soil yeah. carbon coalition. Yeah, too, so. yeah. Um, one of our um, co-conspirators. He um, <clears throat> he and I did a, a, a training there and a facilitation with the Marin um, uh, County Board of Supervisors, which was a really powerful thing. Mm. And that and our consultancy with John Wick and Peggy Rathman led to the Marin Carbon Project with what you've done 
And because the Marine Carbon Project, I, I suppose, as a policy vehicle has been a fairly powerful one, but I would say that it, its findings were fairly narrow in terms of their, their scope of, of uh, recommendations, like the recommendations zoomed right in on the, on the power of compost from their perspective. Right. Right. as opposed to holistic plant grazing or key line pattern cultivation or some of the other methods that people... Uh, yeah. Could you, could you speak to some of that with what you learned in your touring with Peter Donovan and the Soil Carbon Challenge? Yeah. So Because I think you guys got as pro- probably as big a sample of sample audience as anything um, with your... With that right, group. and maybe for people, for people who don't know about the Soil Carbon Coalition... Um, Peter yeah. Donovan started that with Abe Collins uh, and um, I think Terry Gompert was the third person that yes. started that. With them. Uh, and, and that was probably back in 2006 or seven, something like that. But then he got, he got on the road um, a few years later than that and bought the school bus and kind of outfitted it as a traveling home and soil lab. And, and um and he's actually put in over 300 baseline plots all around North America. So mostly in the United States, but a fair number in Canada. And a little bit, a little bit of Mexico. Mexico yeah. yeah. And, and uh, when I met him, I met, he was one of the very first people that I met right after um, reading Judy's book. And, uh, and I've, and part of, part of what drew me into that project is I thought, well, this is something that I can do without going back and getting an agricultural degree. Cause of course, Peter didn't have a degree no. of any sort. He just gave himself permission to do it. And yeah. we both, we both talk a lot about the power of giving yourself permission um, yeah. that if you're interested in something, go for it. Yeah. And uh, everybody thinks you have to wait for someone to <laughs> tell you, you know, put a hat on your head. <laughs> so, so, uh, so when I met him, he was just starting to re-monitor. And, um, and one of oh, the so, first oh, trips so I... Go, so go back to places... Go back, so three to five years later, yep. Yeah. And, uh, and the first trip that I went on with him was up to Saskatchewan, mm-hmm. Canada, um, to where Neil Dennis and Blaine Jardis and Ralph and Linda Corcoran and the... Uh, Trent and Carolyn Wall, and there, there's a group of holistic managers yes. there. I don't, I don't know how many is in their support group, but they have, I think, 12 to 15 farmers, and then they're very connected to, yes. to other regions as well. But yeah. they've, been, <clears throat> they've been meeting as a support group for like more than 15 years, I think, every month. And they get together and they say, what's going well, what's not going well, um, is there any urgent business? So if anybody's having a marriage problem or, you know, cows got out or whatever, they deal with that. And if, if not, if there's nothing urgent, then they go back to the, you know, what have you learned? What, what's working? What's not working? And the reason I'm bringing them up is because those farms, uh, their gains in soil carbon over three years were just off the charts different than everywhere else. Part of it is, you know, they're in what used to be old, old prairie yes. soils. However, um, Blaine, who I know the best of that group, I know, he, you know, his had been heavily tilled, heavy chemical farming for years and years and years and years. I mean, he said the soil just stank. Talk about smell. Um, and he was losing money, and, you know, typical story. And he switched over to holistic management. And their their numbers were just extraordinary at, at at depth at different depths too. So it wasn't just on the surface, and um, and since then, you know, we've remonitored quite a few others, and nothing's come close to that. And and a fair number of people who were doing, you know, what seemed like reasonable management didn't have that much change in soil carbon. Now, Peter didn't start doing water infiltration testing until around that time when I joined up with him. Yeah. And so we don't have baselines for those, but we do know that some people like Gabe Brown is showing, you know, crazy change in yes. infiltration. Yeah. Um, and that's really about the soil structure and the... Yeah. 
the aggregation. And uh, I know that Abe, because uh, I work quite closely with Abe and have since 2006, um, that uh, that's a really big thing for him. And that's why he's teamed up with people like Dr. John, John Norman. Yes, um, John is wonderful. Yeah. 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 For that very purpose. So, so from that, uh, like you've developed a, um, a pretty good understanding in the field. I suppose it would have been useful if you had gone on the first tour and then gone on the second, because then you would have seen the, the changes. But notwithstanding, um, you would have seen the, the stories of people too. And I got a bit of that from you, from the, the parts yeah. of pathology of care where you'd written about that. Yep. <laughs> Son slept leaving for baseball, baseball Focus. practice. Focus. <laughs> um, yeah, that, I mean, that's been the best part of this. Um, and I feel super lucky to have gotten to do that traveling is because I feel like having, you know, I'm mostly on the East Coast, but we've spent a lot of time all through the Midwest and way up in the most northern parts of Canada and then the West Coast and not so much in the South, but um, Texas and Oklahoma. Just an enormous perspective on what's going on with people who are trying to do something new in agriculture. Uh, yeah, because when I look and, at one and, of the one of, how, yeah. what they're facing in terms of their issues, you know. Yeah, I suppose where I'll go with this is um, one of the points that you've got here is that the the U.S. is pretty divided on a lot of issues these days. Does does the soil conservation divide along political lines in the U.S. and all of that? And so, were you was that influenced that question influenced? And the second one here, how how would you describe the conversations and politics? happening around soil, soil carbon, climate change and water in the US at the moment. I know in our own case, um, when we did the, the, what I think was one of the world's first carbon farming courses, the soil, water and carbon in 2007, which we self-funded, mm -hmm. uh, the touring of for the five of us, cost a bundle, <laughs> five, five sets of round world tickets, um, mm -hmm. that... When we came home, that was around the time, I don't know if you know about the Australian political um, scene at the time. We, we, yeah. Some, somewhat, yeah. Yeah, well, later, later that year, we uh, changed from having a conservative uh, government, which had been in government for 13 years, and were pretty big deniers, climate change deniers. And mm -hmm. then we, and the new Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, Rudd came in, and he was, you know, he, he, uh, famously said that uh, global warming or climate change is the greatest moral challenge of our generation mm -hmm. and swept into office and set up a whole range of programs um, and so on. But before too long, um, he, he was not a very good prime minister, um, so not a very good person with people. Um, he, uh, he couldn't get through his climate change policy which was a cap and tra trade policy, and there was a coup against him. And Julia Gillard became our first female prime minister. Yeah, and she famously said, um, "There will be no carbon tax under a government I lead." And then, um, in a subsequent election, um, because it was so close, she uh, teamed up with the Greens, and the Greens made her, in their arrangement, do a carbon tax. And so I said, I think it was in two thousand and eight. When we, when we were planning for our next program, I think we did another program in the US called the Carbon Farming Series and the Carbon Economy Series. And when we decided to come home in 2010, I decided that carbon was a dirty word. And so we developed the Region Ag brand and went on from there because just the, the carbon situation just became so toxic. So with all of that, I mean, it was we because we were swapping in between the US and Australia and Australia and the US really lead the, the space as far as carbon farming is concerned, yeah. as far as I can see anyway. And that, that's really interesting. Go ahead, finish. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say that um, where we are today, um, it's sort of coming back around that carbon is not, the dirty word it was, especially when it's associated with farming and it seems to have matured. Mm -hmm, <laughs> almost. Mm -hmm. um, but it yes, has changed no, yeah. a lot. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like back then it seemed like it was, an, and it still is a bit of an arms race. Um, 
you know, whoever can work out the carb, the soil carbon thing, or whoever develops the 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 low cost methodology for doing this or whatever, they're the ones who are going to win the jackpot. You know, they're right. going to win, they're going to win right. Richard Branson's favour, or yeah, <laughs> with the prize he's never given out. Um, you know, all of those sorts of things are going to be there, and it seems it's like it's it's changed a lot and lost some of its um, oomph. Not important. Well, I always yeah. say, I yeah, I mean, there's a few things that I like to talk about carbon. First of all, a lot of people are who who we when what we call drink the soil carbon Kool Aid, as yeah. I did, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. um, suddenly get all excited about it. Uh, a a lot of people don't really know anything about the carbon cycle, or or they assume that soil carbon is something off of the periodic table that's in soil, and of course the biochar movement. Um, kind of um, amplifies that that we can yes. we can make charcoal and we can dump it in soil and we will have more soil carbon. Nothing against biochar, but it yeah. gives people a picture of something that is very inert. Yes. So so you know, as you know, soil carbon is the living and the dead and the very dead, and <laughs> and that that's um, and that each of those are playing a different role. But but understanding the carbon cycle in terms of of that it's it's about life um and life processes is a very different way of thinking about it than as something sort of on the periodic table that's a problem mm -hmm. um and that we need to bury in the ground in chambers somehow so that it won't get back out again you know? yeah, 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 <laughs> so, yeah. and then there's the piece about the oceans also that um i was sort of shocked when when i learned this not that long into my explorations of this that that of course the oceans have been holding all of this carbon for us. You know they've been kind of re-equilibrating things, and then when we draw it down, if we do, that they're going to let let up. So, so that so the idea that it's a sort of one-to-one -one ratio that if we if we increase soil carbon by this much, the oceans are going to you know that that that's that that's that much less in the atmosphere. Um, that's not actually true. No. And for example, the book Drawdown didn't address that as far as i know no so 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 i think one piece is just getting people up to speed so you're saying um, that saying that books like drawdown and a lot of others are, are fairly simplistic and mechanical about this um that they're making an assumption that that you know one ton of soil carbon is one ton less in the atmosphere yes but since the oceans are going to give up Yes. As, as atmospheric carbon gets drawn down in soils, that that equation ultimately, yes, somewhere down the line, that's true. But it's not it's not instant. And it's as Peter likes to say, there's no way to test that really. Like, no. we can't prove that the soil carbon that I just grew here, that my microbes grew, or, is is that there's less in the atmosphere because it's too large of a system to test. Yes. Um, so, but, but you know what what the what the impact of that is in terms of local water temperature weather productivity nutrient density of food all of that um soil structure etc is that's that those things are measurable mm. so when it comes to the conversation um in the in the around soils and and politics in the US where we where we are today well, what I see is that on, that on the coasts, people who are typically not doing a lot of farming, they may be they may be involved in small farms, which is still still farming, but it's sure. um, they're they're not large, they're not managing large tract of land. Yes. Um, and a lot of the people very interested in soil carbon on the coasts aren't managing any land; they're more interested in policy, et cetera, and. In, and that those groups, and this is very broad, you know, kind of mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but they tend to have, a, like you were saying, a little bit more of a simplistic view that that carbon is something that we that is a problem, and 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 soil is a solution. Mm -hmm. um, and don't really have a sense of how soil accepts water, for example. Mm -hmm. Or how important that is in terms of flooding and drought and erosion, et cetera. So 
whereas in the center of the country, uh, you know, in the what what used to be the prairies, and people who are managing often much larger farms, they're they're thinking they don't even talk about soil carbon. They're talking about soil health, mm-hmm. and I kind of wish that we weren't called the Soil Carbon Coalition because because everybody wants to talk about soil carbon, but it is a chance to help help broaden the conversation. Mm. So. Well, this goes to, you know, it's, it's, it should be the Soil Ecology Coalition in, in your, to use your parlance, therefore. Yeah, but that's, you know, I mean, the, all, all these words get tired so quickly. Yeah, yeah no, <laughs> but, I agree. I, but I, words are powerful. Um, I, I, I think yeah, from the perspective yeah. that um, you, again, with your holistic outlook um, and, and indeed people like Peter and Abe and all of the other characters involved, that they are... I mean, one of the ties that binds them is their holism and their yeah. Whole, like, yeah. ecological view. And, that, and um, it's interesting that the people on the coasts are looking at the element um, as opposed to the whole outcome, whole raft of outcomes. Yeah, and there's some there's some major exceptions to that. I mean, there's sure, some very sure. good no, work no, okay. all over the country. But but back to the political piece. Um, part of where I see that conversation going is those people who are seeing carbon as a problem and soil as a solution, very often they're they're kind of like, well, we have to teach these farmers how to do this. And it's, and this is, so in the United States, this is typical that where the, where the universities are, where the cities are, et cetera, think that everybody in the middle of the country is sort of a dumb peasant. Yes. And, and, um, we have that too. Yeah, it's interesting, <laughs> uh, and it's it's so so. A lot of what I do do because I get to travel a lot is try to bridge that conversation and say, "Hey, actually, um, you know, the, the soil health movement really started in <laughs> it didn't start out here." <laughs> and there's some incredibly brilliant and creative people doing awesome work. Yeah, and then the other the other piece is because if you tie carbon directly to climate change in the United States, climate change is super polarized. Correct. And and there's an assumption that um, that Republicans would be against soil carbon because it has something to do with climate change. When in fact, a lot of our again, a lot of our leaders in the soil health movement are very conservative, conservative Christian driven by a sense that they're, um, you know, restoring God's creation. Um, they're, many of them voted for Trump and yeah. they and, and it's like, you gotta, you can't, you can't be talking down one thing and ignoring what's where, where all of the good information is coming from. Yeah. So. yeah. 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 And I can't talk to you because you voted for Trump. Exactly. Yeah. So I see soil as potentially, once people start getting that idea, I see it as potentially this incredible bridge for a lot of wonderful conversations. Yeah. Um, well, we seem to be in that kind of space broadly that um, uh, people would describe them. And there's the alt left and the alt right and, uh, and never the twain shall meet. And there's yeah. a lot of, a lot of that. So, whereas when I, mean, I was always raised and, Trying, I've tried to raise my children to to be able to be accepting of all people and um, try and accept all views. And um, I mean, a lot of our friend group, uh, for example, uh, if if Trump was here, he'd, they'd probably vote for him. Yeah. But it doesn't stop yeah. us being friends, and it doesn't stop them from being um, people who care. Uh, yeah. Which is kind of the the big the big thing here, isn't it? It's it's the care. And which is well, again, I'll come back to your the 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 um, the title of your book. So, mm-hmm. do you see that that we like we are in a we are in a polarized point in politics, and that's it's not new, but I suppose we're at a particularly polarized point in in the in politics now, and in the general conversation because I, I think in large part because of the adoption of social media gives everyone, mm-hmm. everyone a, a font from yeah. the, to leap and to deride or champion. Um, do you think that there's 
um, a big possibility of soil carbon and um, and soil health entering into the entering into the political picture better than it is right now. Um, do we see? I mean, does it really? Is it going to take us? You know, where's the threat that? You know, uh, I know that when when um, Charlie Massey, who you may well have heard of, uh, Dr. Charlie Massey, who wrote who wrote extensively on Walter in his book, the um, the Call of the Reed Warbler, which is on about a new dawn of regenerative agriculture in Australia, mm-hmm. and he he speaks of um, of transformation in agriculture and um, and that in, for all of the people that he uh, met when he was studying his, or when he was researching his PhD, which became that book, that most of them had had something go wrong in their life before they yeah. shifted over. And it's similar. I'm sure it's similar in your health practice. Uh, yes, that's, had, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah, that people needed to have a bit of a kick up the bum, whether it was a cancer or some other malady. Do you, do you sometimes think that, or somehow think that um, we need a bit of that. Do we need it? Do we need a new dust bowl <laughs> um, for for something to really kick on? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think we're I think we're necessary. we're there, but <laughs> um, I think I think we're having our dust bowl. Uh, I do I do think that that the water situation, and that's one of the reasons I like talking about water rather than mm-hmm. soil carbon. Mm-hmm. The water situation is something we can all relate to. Mm-hmm. Um, I, want, I once made the mistake of saying, well, and water isn't polarized the way that climate change is. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I think I was speaking in, uh, you know, in California or something. They said, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so there, there are definitely water politics. But, but, um, but I, I do think that the climate, just the, the climate argument people are so tired of it mm-hmm. and people are so um, angry on both sides of it mm-hmm. that that just the just the opportunity of shifting to talking about water is sort of a relief and uh, and I, I so I, I feel like that's very hopeful and that that when when I speak somewhere and I can get people thinking in that way, I see the room kind of relax. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's sort of, I suppose, in some ways, the lack of polarity makes it less interesting in one way. <laughs> but because um, <laughs> people love to have a right. fight too, you know, right. but, um, especially right. especially given that we have an adversarial political system and. Um, that's kind of what it's based upon. Um, yeah. We, we um, <clears throat> here in our state, um, and this, I, I suppose it, I suppose it uh, comes to how people engage, whether people are prepared to engage in the political process. And I, um, like for, I, I'm very interested in politics and have been since I was a child, but, uh, but I don't want to be a politician. Mm-hmm. I don't have any interest in that at all. And a lot of people think, I suppose, or I think, um, a lot of people think to become involved in politics, you have to become a politician or you right. have to become in the party stuff, but they don't realise that you can actually be involved in the bureaucracy and in influencing people in there. Because one thing I learned pretty early is that the pol- politicians change, but the bureaucracy always stays. And mm-hmm. a lot of the, I think in the United States and to an extent here in Australia, some of the most powerful people in this whole space have been bureaucrats. Um, a lot of them working for organisations like the NRCS and some uh, and, and so on, and in local government and in state right. government are, are really, really powerful people. Can you speak to some of those that you've worked with along the journey? Uh, you know, Walter, well, I mean, Walter is one example of one. Right, of that's true, yeah. Yep. And, I mean, certainly um, Ray Archuleta is, you know, is an example in the States. Yeah. Oddly, there's a whole generation of these people who work for the NRCS and the USDA who are all retiring at the same time. Mm. Um, (laughs) So there's there's several, several of them have just retired and they're all suddenly um, giving much more exciting talks. um, Yeah. Unchained or unleashed. (laughs) 
um, but but yes, the soil health movement really. I mean, the NRCS, which the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which used to be the Soil Conservation Service that started after the Dust Bowl, um, is a you know is a government division of the Department of Agriculture, and they were uh, working with local farmers and and started to put together these soil health principles, which I think are one of the most powerful statements out there. And I've tried to reframe them a bit more in terms of biological work. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I mean, I love that they've made them so simple, but I think that you can say more with just a few more words and explain mm -hmm. why, why you would want to do such a thing, why you wouldn't want to till, et cetera. So, having those principles to follow is actually super radical departure from what the NRCS usually does, which is to sort of standardize and teach best management practices. Mm -hmm. And I have an article that I've been sitting on. I, maybe I'll post it tonight, but <laughs> I've been sitting on it for over a year. Um, someone asked me, someone uh, um, actually our, our organic farming association asked me um, to kind of co-write a grant with them. And, and it was all about best management practices for soil carbon. And, and I, I sat down and wrote for 14 hours straight and wrote this paper called The Power of Principles and the Trap of Thre Best Practices. Mm. And uh, some of the points that I make are that um, when you start defining best management practices, First of all, it's a huge amount of work. I mean, the NRCS, if you look them up, it's hundreds of pages and they all have codes and this and that. Absolutely. Whereas the principles, you know, they've got them down to four or five principles. I have maybe 10 in the way that I write them. But, but you know, it's a, it's a one pager, right? The yeah. principles. <laughs> um, another thing is best management practices are always going to be outdated, right? Yes. Because it's, it's, it's what you've figured out already. Mm -hmm. So it's not the thing that you are in the process of figuring out. By the time it gets codified and accepted and the research has been looked into, that's maybe several years old. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we're learning stuff every day about, mm -hmm. about how, to, how to put these principles into practice. Mm, that's a really interesting point. Another one is that it's, it's, it's inherently... Um, cuts off people's creativity. Mm. And we see that all the time that farmers like Gail Fuller who are doing something creative and then they can't, because they are supposed to be following best management practices, they can't get a loan or they can't get crop insurance or, you know, something like that. Yeah. So, so they, the best management practices actually stop people's creativity. Mm. Whereas principles are, are beautifully, um, What's the word? They, you know, they they feed creativity because they give you an idea of something to follow based only on nature. I don't know if you can pull up. What I'm not sure what people are seeing here. They're seeing us, but we can yeah, pull up the. Principles. Yeah, I can. I can. So, um, what's the what page am I looking for? Um, if you go to um, ddpursehouse.com. Okay. And then, then depending on your sheet, it'll either be under more or it'll just be a tab at the top of the soil health principles. Uh, soil health principles, there we are. So. Yeah, one thing, one thing that struck me with this, uh, uh, why I think that's a really great set, we, I've just been working with a group of other old clients and um, producers uh, network here in Victoria, our state. Um, we've had some. We've been working directly with the with the state government, uh, Department of Ag, to reframe some planning provisions around. Um, I'll, I'll mostly. I'll oh, better sign up, everyone. There you go. Be part of this great community. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that um, we were working on with this it was it's it's the it's planning for animal sustainable animal industries um, mm -hmm. and um, the state government were looking to well the state government drafted some new planning laws um, to um, well to make to, to give more oversight to 
um, through the planning um, through the planning system for the introduction of um, omnivores into agricultural landscapes because mm -hmm. that's something that people are seeing more and more of. You know, we've put animals in sheds for a time and now as an outcome of us bringing Joel Salatin to Australia about seven times and, mm -hmm. and you know, all of the rest of it, that there's more and more people putting animals out, outdoors again. Yeah. and what are the implications for that to the environment. And in going through, I can't say so much because the um, I've got NDAs and <laughs> all of the rest of the government. But one of the things that we looked at was um, was principles. Um, and in some of the work that they've now done, which is great, um, they they uh, they looked at principles as being the approach rather than code. Yeah, is, that's great. Which is the code still coming? Um, mm -hmm. But I but in hearing you and thinking about it, it certainly makes sense because i think your point of that once you write a code that, in, that then that's sort of like a limitation and it is um, and we often talk about um regulation being way behind innovation and yeah and yeah whereas principles you've got the room to be innovative haven't you yeah and I, I mean one of the things i talk about is that like good cooking schools don't teach recipes mm. right they teach the principles of how mm. the chemistry of food and the, you know, thinking about flavors, et cetera. And, and once you understand those principles, then you can be creative. Yeah. And likewise, if, if you have a system that's totally based on best practices, it creates bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. It creates hierarchy. It creates mm -hmm. this top-down idea that a farmer, again, is a dumb peasant who needs somebody to advise them yeah. about what the best practices are. Whereas you could hand them this sheet of the principles and say, and this is one of the exercises I do when I'm teaching, so let's look at these principles. What are, what are all the ways... What are all the practices you could think of for each one of these things? Mm -hmm. And what are some that you might make up off the top of your head just while we're sitting here that you might try and see how it works on your farm, in your context, in your climate, with the amount of rain you're getting, the amount of money you have, with the materials you have available to you, right? Keeping soil covered, we could do that with newspaper, we could do that with wool, we can do it with, you know, chaff, we could do it with any, any number of things. What do you have available? How much space are you trying to cover? Right? There's no best practice. It's, it's totally up to you how you want to keep your cell covered. Just keep it covered. You know? Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah right. well, that was, that, was so, one of the, that was one of the principles we were able to get into this legislation, which I could probably say um, that uh, ground cover, um, that there was a minimum amount of ground cover that had to be mm -hmm. maintained. And, yeah. that, that, and that, that by default, um, that... Um, that, it, that required a whole range of best practices. Mm -hmm. You can't have living or, or the residue of living uh, ground cover without some best practice, no matter what mm -hmm. the era. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's really so, cool. So, I, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm all about getting rid of um, hierarchy other than, I mean, I do think leadership is important in sure. terms of certain times of life it's helpful to have somebody who's <laughs> okay okay i'll go first <laughs> but but um but i think in terms of education i'm all about self self-education groups and peer support groups like what i was talking about in saskatchewan um where you're where you're learning you're learning from each other you're trying things you're reporting back and and i think those kinds of groups it's really helpful if you have principles or if they're even coming up with principles. So another exercise I do is to say, okay, let's look at a conventional farm and let's look at a very productive natural landscape. Uh, what are the principles? Like what are, what's different in terms of how food is grown in those two? Mm -hmm. And that's, you can, you can come up with the cell health principles. You can add them by doing that. You know, are there living roots in the ground year round? in one and or the other is the soil disturbed etc so this is this work that you've done here is fed into another book that you've worked on um understanding soil health and watershed function a teacher's manual yeah um yeah 
where should I find? Is that on the soil carbon code? Here, you know what? Already? I'm going to, um, I can share my screen, right? Yeah, that, that's it. You sure can. Yeah, let's see. I've got a bunch of things here that we can look at. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah take over, please. Okay. So, um, uh, let's see. I think it's. Now, what uh, do I need to do to share? Uh, do you want to? Uh, should I uh, share? Do you share my screen? Uh, just let me see what the buttons tell me. I can. Oh, here we go. I got it. I got it. You got it. Yeah. Um. Here we go. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, there we go. Beautiful. So that's yeah. That's the manual, and that's the place. It's a free download. Yeah. Um So so anybody can. Um, anybody can find that there and and it's 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 a work in prog progress there's chapters that we want to that i, I want to add in there that should be coming fairly soon if, if people would just stop asking me to speak <laughs> <laughs> oh that's good uh, um uh maybe we, maybe we just have a little fun here we'll go back um here's the river here's you want to um you want to make that little possible? tour? Wanna, yeah, let's do this slideshow. Thing. Yeah, where are we? I'm, uh, there we go. Okay, there's my dog. <laughs> little tour well, down to the river. So this is the Ampampanusik River where I live, um, right behind my house here in Vermont. Lovely. And um. Winter and summer, we're always down there. And Vermont, um, I, you know, I spent a bit of time there with, uh, with, with our friendship with Abe, with, uh, with Abe but also yeah. um, with uh, Megan Giroux and uh, Sterling College and oh, great. a few yeah. other organisations that we've worked with over the years. And yeah, there's a lot going on in Vermont. Um, yeah, there is. It's, it's quite an epicentre. But one of the things about water there is, and I suppose it's the company I keep, um, is the conversation around Lake Champlain and um, nitrogen yes. runoff and, yes. and uh, phosphorus runoff, etc. It's, yep. it's it's sort of in your face, isn't it? It is. I, I, where where I live is a couple hours south of Lake Champlain, and where someone was at our our town meeting. We, we govern by a town meeting where everybody comes together and votes to get and discusses things, which is a, one of the wonderful things about Vermont politics. Yeah. Uh, we know, you know, we know everybody in town because there's only yeah. 2,000 of us and, <laughs> and we know all the politicians right up to Bernie. So, <laughs> so yeah. um, and they were, they were sort of complaining. We were talking about that we'd had, here, let me just jump down to this slide. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The, so, so we had this storm on July 1st. This is now years after Irene. Um, and this is the road behind my house mm. that, you know, normally looks like that yes <laughs> so yeah. we had this little rainstorm on july 1st it wasn't called a hurricane or anything else but we 75 percent of the roads in our town were damaged wow um i think five million dollars worth of damage mm. and we're getting we're starting to get this you know anytime we have a big rainstorm we get really extreme damage mm. so so, the, pub, so, um, so the, the, the public, the public cost is starting to really bite um, in an era when yeah. public, public monies are being shrinked. The pool. I mean, you, th yeah. you think about a town of 2000 people and most of those aren't adults, right? Mm. The pocketbook. And, and we have to pay for these repairs before we can get reimbursed for it, you know, by FEMA or something like that. So we're having to take out loans to fix the roads and, you know, and pay interest on the loans, and that adds up very quickly. So they yeah. were starting. To, I was just getting back to Lake Champlain. That people were saying, "Well, everything in Vermont about water is all about Lake Champlain. What about us?" Mm -hmm. So, so yes, Lake Champlain is definitely um, there's there's Lake Champlain. You can see it's surrounded by beautiful farmland, but mm -hmm. that's what it looks like up close. Yeah, um, pretty nasty. And yeah. my son's girlfriend's father is a neurologist. Um, who who he was interviewed in that movie i don't know if you've seen called toxic puzzle that's no, all yeah, about i've heard of it link, link between um i linking tend, to, tend to avoid all of these I know, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we know too much uh, link linking algae blooms with um not just with the acute neurological and digestive stuff that we know can happen but with als and parkinson's and potentially wow. alzheimer's 
um, and it's when this stuff gets airborne they're finding that it's actually most dangerous so if you live near a waterfall or a dam or um, you know my son's applying for a job as a ferry as a ferry boat driver and I was like oh back and forth across Lake Champlain all day long I don't know you know <laughs> so, <laughs> um, um, so 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 we have you know we have these these issues when it rains here and Vermont we're lucky to be in a place where we get if anything too much water um, yeah. but it's this is what we're dealing with so so what I've been trying to talk about is well what are the economics of the soil sponge mm. you know if we were to if and, and of course when we when we fix the soil sponge we're fixing everything right I mean we're yeah. we're fixing the lake we're fixing the roads we're fixing human health we're fixing our local economy and I always say, look at this picture. Notice that that where the trees are, hmm, <laughs> there wasn't any damage there, right? Yeah, yeah. Because they're feeding that sponge. So, um, so, and I don't know how how are we doing time wise? Yeah, we're fine. Yeah, we're fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is what what I like to talk about it as a living matrix that it's it's carbon rich yes it is about soil carbon but it's really um soaking up water and this is the exercise that i'll do mm -hmm. i could do it live if we want but we could probably get a pretty good idea from yeah. this picture that um and i'll get hundreds of cowboys all poking holes in cups <laughs> making <laughs> rain clouds at a conference which is a great sound <laughs> everybody gets a toothpick in a cup uh, you can't do that. You can't do that on the East Coast because they get upset that you're wasting food and plastic. But, oh, right. <laughs> but in Kansas, who cares? <laughs> Let's get out the plate. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Oh, they lo I know they love a good they love a good plastic plate in the, in the Midwest, um, oh. and um, and it's less cleaning up. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, so, so I have people make a uh, make a rain cloud and then. I talk about flour as a stand-in for the sand, silt, and clay, you know, just the mineral substrate, just the broken yeah. down rocks. Yeah. And, um, and that it actually behaves very similar to degraded soil if you yeah. rain on it. Yeah, and hydroscopic, uh, hydrophobic. Yeah. And, yeah. and so we talk about what, what happens there, what do you see happening? There's erosion, there, it's not soaking in. If you put the plate out in the sun, uh, it would evaporate quickly. Uh, if you were, you know, if your house was on the edge there, you'd be in a flood. If you were a fish, you'd be swimming in water that had all the chemicals, whatever were on the field in it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then, then we, then what do you need to turn flour into bread? You need microorganisms, right? So the microorganisms do work. Uh, it's not the same work in bread as it is in soil, but the result is actually super similar in yeah, terms so of the function. There's, there's an aggregation. Yep, yep. And so we have this porous but aggregated thing that is both absorbent of water but also hydrophobic so it doesn't fall apart in water. So mm -hmm. it's this beautiful combination. And we have the you know the fungal hyphae and the plant mm -hmm. roots that are tying things together and we have the snots and slimes and glues that are sticking things together and then we have all the living things that move through there and create little tunnels and of every yeah. different size um, it's, a, it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful and simple and anybody can get that i i have to say that um one of the things that i've talked about for years is um in holistic management when i'm looking at doing grazing plans and getting people's heads around um, relative paddock quality is that uh, i i say that some paddocks are pumpernickel and some people some paddocks are white bread Yes, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I was to put my pumpernickel yeah. on there, I'd have a fair oh, yeah, bit of yeah. run. Yeah. I would have a fair <laughs> bit of run runoff. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I um, yeah, the the white feather bread, as my wife calls it, would be uh, is perfect for this example. But um, yeah. it's a really great um, it's a yeah, that's a really really elegant tool, and it's uh, one one um. One video that we show a lot, or have shown a lot of over the years, is Peter Donovan's um, water cycle video, which is mm -hmm. which is really funny at the same time as it being, because um, he says, you know, when you 
when you haven't got enough, when you haven't got enough water, you just go and buy a bigger pump, and, you, and you <laughs> right. say, it's all cups and Pyrex yeah. jars and all the rest. Yeah. And, so, and it's super powerful this stuff. Um, yeah, because in the microcosm you can see it all, and yeah. So, so you, 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 what are some of the reactions that you've got from this type of um, example? Well, this is for whatever reason. This this is the key teaching tool, and I'll often I'll often follow it with this slide, which is a great picture of a rainfall simulator from Tennessee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in that in that they really got it just right, so you can yeah. see you know that from the front and the back, um, just a perfect yeah. um, perfect flow of of information there. Yeah, and um, and. I'll ask people, well, which would you rather, you know, if you lived somewhere that was, a, there was a lot of rain, where would you rather live? Then they'll say, well, you know, with the bread. And then, well, what if you live somewhere where there was hardly any rain? And then they start thinking, oh, still the bread. You know? <laughs> yeah. So that's a key, I think that's a key, a key piece of information there because everybody thinks it's so context specific and mm. in some senses it is. But in other ways, it's not, it's not at all. And that's where the principles come in. That, mm -hmm. that if you have this, it doesn't matter how much water is coming down, you're in better shape. And, 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 and I think that's the point in this exercise where people start to get really interested because they start seeing, hey, this is something that could fix a lot of different problems, you know? So it's like, wait a minute, this is like, if you're in the desert, this would be better. Or if you're in Vermont, this would be better. Or if you're, you know, I talk about, what if there's a big wind came along, which would you rather have near you? Or, um, you can go through tons of different questions and it all comes back to the bread. So then people want to say, how do you make the bread? <laughs> and that's yeah. what you want. <laughs> yeah, 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 so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it goes back to your principles discussion, and exactly, and, and, not, yeah. and also not not having a recipe for the bread. Yeah, uh, that yeah, uh, that there's ingredients, but there's not a recipe, and there's a exactly there's a method. Right, and if it and if we're talking literally about bread, then it, you know that you need you need some sort of flour, and you need some moisture, and you need some micro mi right. microbial work. You know, and yeah. that's basically the same is true. You need. You need a mineral substrate, you need water, and you need microbial work. Yeah. Right? And, and the microbial work is fueled by the plants. So, yeah. but, but if you have all of those, it'll, it'll you know, wherever you are, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work one way or another eventually. So yeah. you get out of the way. That's fantastic. So, so the better question, though, I mean, the big one that I think we're all struggling with is how do you create the conditions in which this will happen? Mm -hmm. sort of the social conditions so. yeah well that's that's something that we um i i um in the in here in australia one of the biggest social conditions is that people don't want to be seen to be doing much different yes um yeah. and that's I, I don't think it's any different anywhere else um, yeah peer pressure been, well, it's particularly pervasive. Like even uh, I woke up this morning. My we we care full time for our um, our mother and my mother in law who's ninety. Yeah. She wakes up. It's, she's got to a stage where she's uh, waking up through the night. So it's a bit like having a a, a, a young baby again. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. um, but uh, I woke up this morning and um, I was lying there thinking about oh I've always wanted to have a a, a block of land in the Wimmera, which is a really big grain growing area to the west of us here and i was thinking oh yeah you could buy a block out there for it's about two thousand dollars an acre and that's mm -hmm. really good it's really good country and i thought i'd do pasture cropping out there or no-kill cropping but then i thought gee i'm gonna get i'm gonna stand out like a like a sore thumb yeah. uh, and yeah. no, no, you know we've got areas like that now and i know this is the same in the u.s where we have animalist landscapes mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. And to shift to pasture in those landscapes, or to do that sort of thing, is is really going to make you stand out, isn't it? And that's a mm -hmm. hard thing, because a lot of these people are socially conservative; um, they're not extroverted, and right. um, it's it yeah, it can alienate you, which is the last thing you want to be in an already alienated landscape. Exactly. Yeah, and I don't know, I don't know about Australia, but in the United States and in 
many other countries now, um, farmers have a higher suicide rate than any other profession. Yeah, I so, so don't know this. Already matter, very it would stressed. Yeah, yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if that was the case. The other thing that's in all of this, which is um, P.A. Yeomans um, in the 1950s did a, soil, uh, did a um, video that was sponsored by the Rural Bank of Australia. And um, it said at the end of it, because so he, the video was about looking over his farm and his landscape and all of his soil treatments and how much soil he'd built and all the trees that he'd installed and how much more productive it was and the water systems he'd built and et cetera. And the, the video was sponsored by the Rural Bank of Australia and they said something like, and the Rural Bank puts it on record that we, that we endorse this method. Mm. And that was in 1955. And that was right at that period, as you'd know, when we could have kind of gone either, either way. Um, we could, there, was a lot, there was a lot of brilliant um, soil health practitioners out there mm -hmm. then, um, led in some part by people like Louis Bromfield, who um, was a really big figure in American politics at the time. And... We decided to go with the with we decided to go with the bag of stuff as opposed yeah. to the uh, as opposed to with these principles that you've described, and that was a really really big turning point. And I think we're kind of when I think about banks, um, a lot of producers now don't have too much of a choice about what they can do because mm -hmm. their debt to equity ratios are such that the bank determines who their agronomist is. Exactly. The agronomist, the agronomist determines what methods of agriculture, what in what crops they grow. So we've got a, a modern serfdom out there. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, can you speak to some of that and what you've seen and discussed with people on your travels out there? And some of the, have you come across people in who've been in that sort of position and how? Oh, absolutely. How, how, yeah. How they've sort of shifted. Yeah. Well, there's two examples that come to mind. That are that are more the sad end of things, you know. What mm. one one was? Um, I, I was just spoke at the Oklahoma Association of Conservation Districts, and um, one of one of their big leaders out there just just sold off some of the water rights on his farm to the fracking company because he could pay off a million and a half dollars worth of farm debt for just digging a pond and giving them access to it. Um, and I mean, who, you know, that's, I don't know that I wouldn't do the same thing if I was a million and a half dollars in debt, you know, <laughs> that's a lot of money. So, um, and he said, if I don't do it, someone else is going to sell it to him. So it may as well be me who can pay off my farm debt and do more regenerative agriculture. So he's still completely committed to regenerative agriculture, but anyway, so that, that that's was, a that's a pragmatic out. Yeah. That was a really interesting conversation to me. Yeah. Um, another conversation that comes to mind was somebody who, um, whose best friend was the fertilizer salesperson. Mm -hmm. um, this was a young man, and uh, and he started practicing regenerative agriculture. and And at first, his best friend was worried about him. Well, your crops are going to fail. Or mm -hmm. And then, when he didn't fail he started getting really upset and he said, you're going to put me out of business. You mm -hmm. can't talk about what you're doing, mm -hmm. you know, do it, but don't talk to anybody about it because you're literally going to put me out of business. And this is, you know, these towns, sometimes there's only 200 people in them. Right. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, it's um, complex. And, and that's the thing is you have these towns that have these incredible dependencies in the, in the best possible way of relationships. I mean, that people are really looking out for each other very often, but, what they, the what they call it here is that you know the coffee the coffee shop phenomenon mm -hmm. that someone's you know suddenly got a mixed species cover crop and they walk in uh you know they walk into the coffee shop and literally everyone turns their backs mm -hmm. um, and won't speak to them because their field is too messy or because yeah suddenly there's a cow and they're you know grazing down the corn stubble or um so so those are the those are the hard stories and over and over again, this conversation keeps coming up of what, how do we create these conditions or what is the big stumbling block here? And, that, and everyone seems to agree these days that it's about peer pressure. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think this thing of having support groups and learning how to share 
listening time, which I do with a timer. So I'm, I'm not worried that you're, <laughs> that I'm taking up too much of your time or you're going to become dependent on me or whatever. I've, if we have 20 minutes, I get 10 and you get 10. You know, we're walking. I walk, I'll talk over going up the hill. You talk when we're going down or the other way around. Cause you can catch your breath. When you're going down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, um, but really setting up, setting up a very conscientiously a network of support so that when you start making those more challenging decisions, when you go into the coffee shop and everyone turns their backs, you know who you can call when you get home and say, whoa, that was really rough. And, and most of the people I know who have been very successful and out there with regenerative agriculture are have some version of that it's either something that they they were lucky enough to have some friends who already have that or like in saskatchewan they've set up a regular meeting tight-knit community where there's confidentiality whatever they need to have in place to share what they need to share so um yeah. gail you know, gail fuller is an is an example i don't know if you know gail oh no in okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah in kansas and he's he's an example sort of the other end of that where where you know he was told that he wouldn't be getting the government payments or the crop, crop insurance or bank loans or whatever if he if he kept doing what he was doing and he said well fine then I'll do without and he went through a pretty rough period of not having those but he came out the other side and uh and he's been incredibly inspirational to a lot of other people because of that and similarly John Lundgren um you know, that not a farmer, but an entomologist and award-winning scientist who started getting harassed because he was trying to publish things about neonicotinoid effect on pollinators. And, and finally he said, enough is enough. Um, you know, just, you got to stop bullying me. And he, he ended up suing his own bosses at the USDA, but, but didn't do it. I, I was there with him when he was trying to make that decision. And, and, which was actually at Gail Fuller's school. And he didn't, you know, he didn't do it until he knew that he had people backing him up. Yeah. And, and that was a very powerful, um, that, that was a, a field school that Christine Jones and Gabe Brown were the two speakers and John was there and Gail was there. And it was very moving to, to watch him go through that angst of, you know, having a young family and having to say, because he knew that he would never get hired again mm. by by the government or by any university, you know, which is what it's all about if you're a scientist. So. Sure, absolutely. But look what he's done. I mean, he's created his own research center. I don't know if you've seen the paper that um, Claire Lacan, who was one of his no, uh, grad haven't. students, she and he put out a paper that was basically her her thesis that this is probably the most exciting scientific paper out there right now. Um, they compared 50 conventional corn farms and 50 regenerative ones. And, uh, no. oh. and the, um, yeah, we'll go back to, and, and uh, they found that the regenerative ones were, had only 70% of the yield, but they had twice the profits, the net profits. Mm -hmm. And they found that the more pesticides that the farms used, the more pests they had, a yeah. complete correlation. And then they found that profits were absolutely correlated with percent of soil organic matter. Mm -hmm. So, the, and those three things together with a sample size of a hundred farms, um, pretty exciting yeah, research to have, yeah, to have that and done, and done in a you know, really solid, solid way. So. That's, Nothing surprising to any of us, but to have a to have, you know, a, a, a well done paper oh, on ab it. Absolutely, you know, I, yeah. I'll, I'll have to get that link if I yeah. know at some stage because um, we've got some stuff that, uh, um, well, on Regrarians on the in the Regrarians workplace, which yeah. is an example of a space that we've set up for global support, if you like, as opposed yeah. to more local support. Although some people are in local clusters. Um, yeah that uh, one of the um, questions yesterday was from a guy in Morocco who's a student of ours who's, who's one of his friends has just happened to become a minister in the Moroccan 
um, kingdom there and uh, is someone of influence. And so he's looking at naturally trying to get them to do all of this kind of thing. So he was asking about any papers that were out there. So that sounds like, okay, yeah. although they're not growing too much corn in Morocco. Um, <laughs> no, you just have to convince them that the principles are the same. Yeah. Yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and that's, that's a lot of what it is. And it's interesting too, that people like uh, Christine Jones was at that meeting um, where this scientist decided to make the decision he was because she's um, Christine has been at the, been at the coal front of at the coal face of getting that kind of acrimony yeah. here in Australia for a very very long time. A phenomena yeah. that we have here, which is quite different, particularly in the southern states, is um, we have we have the coffee shop, but we also have the football club and the netball. Mm. Club. Mm. And every small town has one, so we have a pub, yeah. we have a pub, uh, a coffee shop, or a bakery. Um, and then we also have the local football club and the local netball club. So young men play football and young women play uh, netball and mm-hmm. they're all part of the same club. And so as, as, a, as, a, as something that makes it even harder for people to change, it's that, you've not, that you're playing team sports together and, yeah. and that that bond carries on. So you, you, you know, your friends are the people that you were involved in the, Neo tribalism with, with, uh, with, um, with these sporting co- um, right. codes, right. and that makes it very, very difficult for people to change. And of course, the same sort of thing, you know, um, within those clubs and within those networks are people who have the lo- local fertilizer sales mm-hmm. uh, and uh, produce stores and all of the rest of it. And, and I talk a lot about just even fencing i mean uh, a lot of people get their advice on how to fence a property from the people who are selling fencing to them and it's not that they're bad people it's just that they've got their targets and all the rest of it and i say well look you know you're sorry you're gonna have to make your own mind up about this and then so you i've seen it with clients they've gone into that back into there and they've said oh well i I'm doing this and they say, well, how many kilometers of fencing you're putting in? And they say, oh, I need this many posts. And they go, uh, no, you're a bit light on the posts, mate. You've got the wire, right? But you haven't got the posts, right? You know, <laughs> and it gets uncomfortable and, uh, and people don't like to be uncomfortable, which is, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a curious set of circumstances. I see Bruce Davidson is on the, on, on, and, uh, he's one person who, uh, doesn't use very many posts and I don't think he buys any because he just recycles what he's already got. <laughs> In your well, I understand right. there's some quite amazing innovation with, um, with the collars, you know, that the, uh, yeah, like well, yeah, fenceless, well, fenceless, that's, yep. that's a well, whole other conversation. Oh yeah. Inter- well, interesting. What might be possible with that? Yeah. Well, I was in Queensland in, in station country last week and on properties that were a hundred thousand acres and so mm-hmm. on. Um, or 80,000 acres, and that was a big conversation up there. What do you think yeah. about this? I said, oh, well, let's just wait and see on that one. Yeah. So <laughs> you, um, looked at, um, you looked at glyphosate in, um, so you, you said here you focused on glyphosate in some of your talks and in your book. How does that, because this is a really controversial topic yeah. and one that we find is, like putting a stink bomb in the room. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't like to do that, to add that to my talk, and I always feel like, oh. And, and, and as it is now, it often comes up sort of towards the end, and then you're like, oh, God, are well, we going to go? Well, but, it's, we've got half an hour, so that's okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it is, it is a big elephant in the room. I mean, so much of, uh, I know with our friend group, who are mostly conventional producers, um, one of the reasons why we had this conversation a couple of weeks ago um, with some of our friends, they like chemicals because they're reliable mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. there's, there's a predictability to the use of chemicals. And I get that. Um, and, but there's a, by gee, there's a big unknown when you, when you actually engage with nature again. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the, the best 
take I've ever seen in terms of understanding glyphosate and it's and it's really extreme results is a is a video by Terry Vrain um, called engineered foods genetically engineered foods and your health um, it's not at the top of his YouTube videos but but he goes through uh, the different patents of glyphosate and you know at first it was patented as a chelator a chelating agent basically for pipes industrial pipes so find some minerals and they said hey there's this shikimate pathway in mm-hmm. in plants that we could use that for and of course that's only in plants and microbes so it wouldn't hurt people and so <laughs> so they so it became an herbicide and then they you know then they went through the whole genetic engineering thing so some plants could survive the herbicide then it was patented as a broad spectrum anti microbial as an antibiotic by Monsanto. Hmm. Um, very effective. However, it didn't go to market probably because it's very effective against good bacteria <laughs> and it leaves the bad ones. <laughs> so, um, and then of course, more recently it started in, you know, additional use as a desiccant. So mm-hmm. post harvest. So. Yeah. Yeah. Or pre-harvest. So, um, but but the the use of it as an herbicide really important to understand. That started before people understood about the microbiome in humans or in other mammals or even in insects. And things. So, so the idea that microbes are doing work for us you know, that they're the, the working class of our bodies and the working class of the land that we don't, we don't, we don't hear about them, right? Because they're working very quietly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they're producing all the goods and services that we rely on in our bodies, first of all. Um, they turn on our brain function. They make all our brain chemicals. They, you know, they, they rule all of our digestive and endocrine and metabolic functions. You know, our side effects of different drugs depend on what microbes we have in our guts. You can take the microbes from a, from a happy mouse and put them into an anxious mouse and it becomes happy and you can go the other way and the other thing happens. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, and then, of course, we know about what they do in soil is equally important and game-changing. So, so you, so, so glyphosate was invented as an herbicide before, before that concept existed in terms of our own bodies. And so suddenly we're ingesting this broad spectrum antibiotic that is completely altering our inner landscape, just as much as it's altering the exterior landscape. And if you put glyphosate and the current chronic diseases on the skin, you know, on a line, the, the increase in use in glyphosate and the increase in these chronic diseases like autism, like dementia, uh, things like that, and a bunch of cancers and, and uh, obesity, et cetera, et cetera. Then um, there, there, there are values like between 95 and 0.95 and 0.99 all the way along there. I'm meaning it, you know, almost causation. Yeah, high, high, high correlation. Um, and they say if if the autism rates keep going up as they are, that in fifteen years, one of every two children will be autistic. So, so, um, so to me, that's a no brainer leverage point that getting that out of the food system would be awesome. And just like you. Many of the farmers I know rely on that in order to have a no-till system, right? Yep. I mean, so it's now there's, I think there's some, there's an interesting way of looking at it, which is that if your system is really humming and you can tell it's that the system's healthy every now and then, using some glyphosate may be the lesser of many, you know, evils because if the system's really humming, then the system's going to be able to gobble that up. But if you have a system that's limping along or that you're trying to revive, that's, that's a really different scenario. You know, they did a study. I wish I could find this study. 
it's, it's fascinating, but they, they, they had um, cattle that were grass fed very healthy. They gave them a dose of mercury, didn't touch them. They gave the same dose of mercury to cows that were in feedlots, not so healthy, and they died. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, how, you know, can the system absorb that stress? It's really dependent on what's going on in the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of so sense. I'm not, I'm not a purist, you know, even though I have four planets in Virgo, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I, you know, I, 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 think, I, think, I think it's important. To, you, you and my to wife should definitely context. talk. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how else do you have a career that goes all the way from human health to soil health? No. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Virgo had to be involved. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, it's uh, again having this conversation with some friends um, and witnessing some of the lifestyles that exist is that a lot of people are actually happy that they don't have animals in their agricultural ecosystems anymore well mm -hmm. ecosystem is probably not the right word because <laughs> the, <laughs> the agricult their agricultural system, system. yeah, yeah. Um, because it's enabled them to, I mean, they've been able to swap out fertility for something that's imported. Um, they've been able to swap out um, nutrient cycling uh, to an extent by that as well. Um, a lot of them are putting um, microbes into their systems. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole bio ag scene out yeah. there now, which is very much tied in with, um, I know, I know that Monsanto themselves just bought out a, pretty big bio egg brand here um, internationally. And so, so there is that sort of recognition, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I don't want to have animals because that's going to upset my lifestyle. I'm going to become domesticated again. Yeah. Annual, annual crops really suit. Yeah. Um, yeah. But by the same token, uh, it's also a f person who runs that kind of system is often very, very happy with risk. Um, whereas in my observation, people who run livestock systems, you know, people who run livestock systems are very, very risk averse. Mm. People who run uh, cropping systems seem to, to almost be, well, they have to be, they have to be satisfied with risk. And I think, I don't know, here in Australia, because of the absence of subsidies and uh, well, right. we're, 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 right. the sec we're the second least, um, or we get the second least. <laughs> Uh, volume of subsidies in the OECD agriculture. Yep. Um, only New Zealand receives less. Um, and so the safety nets are only crop insurance and drought relief funding welfare. That's, that's pretty well all people have got. Um, but still people seem happy to do that. The other thing that's been really interesting, which we talked about last week, um, and I talk about all the time is that what we've had is this phenomena of landscape value increasing all the time. And so that's enabled people to manage a debt to equity ratio, yeah. which back in the eighties, they would have, they would have been foreclosed on. Right. If you, if you had any of those sorts of conversations with people in, in your, in your talk about the economy of a farm, because it is, it is really, well, to me, it's a really critical part of the conversation is, where your economy is at and where your lifestyle is at and what sort of objectives you have, what quality of yeah. life you want to have. Yeah. Well, I mean, the one thing, uh, n not directly on that question, but, but one of the things that's been so striking in traveling the country is the number of sort of ghost towns that are, you know, agricultural towns that are basically social ghost towns that mm -hmm. most of the storefronts are closed, that there's not anything to do and that a lot of the people have moved off of the farms and they're just sort of machine driven basically. So, um, and I think that gets back to the question of how, do, you know, how do you start building a, a support network? There, there, the, Ray Archuleta, you know, one of the people who I look to a lot for inspiration, he's been ending every talk with saying, so what we need to do, I hate to say this, is we need to get smaller. We need all our farms to get smaller. Uh, and Vermont, that's, I mean, that's what we do here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, micro, micro farming. And, and there's, some, there's some phenomenal things going on. Um, Paul Kaiser, 
yep. the singing frogs farm you know i mean i mean they're they're making a very good profit off of a very small farm there um so but yeah but that's a but that's a commitment that's really different than the i'm going to do this and then i'm going to go on vacation for a couple of weeks you know yeah it is it is so, indeed uh, Bruce, but it gets back to it gets back to the thing about community i mean if you have a good network the you know then you have a friend who can come and take a look at you know keep an eye on things or whatever so I th- and i i think that that's one thing uh, people like colin sice and um and Graham Hand worked together. I don't know if you know Graham Hand, but uh, I know Colin. He and yeah, I, yeah, yeah, he and I spoke yeah. at Gales together. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah well, um, Colin and Graham, and to an extent, Christine Jones have been sort of like a triple act here in Australia for a long time. And yeah, one of the things that they've done, like they've talked about, sort of holistic, holistic plant grazing, holistic management, and uh, mixed species cover cropping, pasture cropping, etc. Yeah, and because a lot of Australian farms are still mixed uh, mm-hmm. because of the lack of subsidies. You've got to have that diversity in your business. Although in right. really strong cropping districts, people have got rid of their fences and their animals altogether. Um, even though it's, you couldn't get actually a better time to, to raise livestock than right now with our prices and mm. whatnot as being as they are. Um, they, um, they often will as a result of that start up some sort of local group. Is that something that, um, because people will, local people will come along. These workshops are also sponsored by our equivalents to the NRCS. Yeah. Um, is that something that you will always and try and have as an outcome of when you're out and about? Well, I'm, yeah, I'm not usually in a place long enough to do that. Although Peter and I are trying to shift to a model that, um, of doing month long residencies. Mm-hmm. So I have another year with my son at home, so that won't start for me soon. Yeah. But we did we did one in California in the Central Valley um, recently where I was be able to be out there for 10 days or so. Peter stayed on. Um, and, and for me, one of the key pieces there when we do start doing that, or to the extent that I can do it when I come in for a shorter visit or remotely, is is to give people some principles, just like there's principles of soil health. There are principles for um, running meetings, for listening, for providing support that are really simple to learn. And if you can learn those principles, then then you don't need an expert to come in and run a support group or something like yeah. that. Or you don't need a psychologist or um, so. So to me, that's definitely an outcome. And I I truly believe that that this movement isn't going to go where we need it to go without that. Because what's going to happen is what we started off talking about is that the carbon market and the investors and the this and people buying up big tracts of land and, you know, from other countries. And there, there's, as the water, as water shrinks, you know, the, the water that's staying on the land, uh, we're, there's going to be a land grab that's already starting to happen of places where there is water. Um, and that's, that's causing stress. That's, you know, when it starts getting to the, to things that you, that you can't live without for more than a day or two. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. There's a biological uh, alarm that goes off that is, um, is well, different all. than like, well, I really like that view of the mountain or something. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and that's all, yeah, that's all so. driving up. That's all driving up the price of land in those districts yeah. as well. So, yeah. um, Bruce Davidson, um, just to go back to the point about uh, using herbicides, he said, I think the conversation regarding the use of any poison in agriculture is a conversation we need to have regardless of whether or not it is comfortable. The truth yeah. will always come out in the end as we are seeing now with an increasing amount of research happening, which goes to yeah. talking about. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so just to, um, as we get closer to the end, we've got quarter of an hour to go. Um, the Atlas of Biological Work. Can oh, you, yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, so also, you're going to show us about that. So that's I, can show, I can show you a little. I mean, I yeah. mean, 
Well, let's see. Actually, I might be able to show you a lot. Let's see. Um, <laughs> if you and you could try doing this at the same time and just see sure. which one of us gets there first. If you plug in um, atlasbiowork.com okay. into a, uh, into your address bar, um, and let me just see if this is um, Atlas Atlas Bio Work B I O as in biological work. Yep, biowork. Yep, dot com. Dot com. Now, my computer is, there should be something that pops up um, that if you, right. if you go, you'll, you'll get, you'll get a, you'll get a um, yep, right, I've got window. It. Oh, here we go. Okay. And so. You'll um, just need to swap here, out. I, you know, I will, I will, I'm going to, um, let me find you, find us again here. Okay, here we go. Um, let me do my, I'll, I'll do my screen because yeah. that way I can um, drive it. Yeah. And drive. Yeah. Now, where did it go? Mm -hmm. Desktop. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Okay. And oh, come on. Get out of there. It's always behind. The yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. Um, okay, so home, so home. So this is something that Peter Donovan's been working on basically during the same time period that I was writing the Understanding Soil Health and Watershed Function Manual. Mm -hmm. And the manual, in many ways, was trying to provide context for this platform. And Peter started talking about it that it's not really just a platform and an app. It's actually... I don't know what word he would use, but it's it's something. Um, it's it's an idea of that doesn't. You don't have to use our platform to do this, but the idea is sort of an expansion of the soil carbon challenge. The idea is that uh, of getting regional groups to share data about change over time mm -hmm. in their land and to and to have workshops and have support groups and have these community conversations about biological work about that working class of our land right yeah, yeah so yeah. um so first of all you may when you click on this add your site um you might need to oh now it's being fussy but when i did it a minute ago it pulled up yeah. a map of exactly where i'm sitting so it's if mm -hmm. you could see like a google earth map of yeah. where we were yeah um and um Data types, this is the funnest thing to play with. So basically you can you can start a site and you can upload the data and you could do it, you could put the data into your phone offline and then come home and when you get on wireless, it'll upload it automatically. Mm -hmm. Or you can do it on your computer or however you want to do that. But it could be something as simple as taking a photo of something that you think is going to change or that has changed, or even a photo of, hey, my neighbor suddenly planted a cover crop. That's cool. Let's take yeah. a photo and put it on. Put it on here, and then you know why why you took this, right? And then you would submit it. Um, one important thing, if you decide to use this right off the bat, is that this is a tree data structure. Originally, we wanted it to be a graph database like Facebook, but the the um, it's not well developed enough out in the world yet to really yeah. play with it. So. So we're going with a tree structure for now, and we might stick with that or not. But, um, but it, you you need to every observation needs to be linked back to the same site. Yes. So if you did a photo, for example, um, you would select a site that you already had rather than start a new one. So, yes. Okay. So um, infiltration. This is this is the funnest one because I'm the water lady, but. Also because, um, so you describe what's going on with each ring and, and then Peter's created these timers so that they're, and they're big. So when your iPhone, your finger does, <laughs> you know, when your wet finger can like hit it and, and you can start for each ring that you pour the water in, you can start it. And then. So, so you have, you have a methodology there for showing people how to set up the ring. Yes. Um, yes. And the, where you can find the methodology. Let me just show you that. So, soilcarboncoalition.org. 
um, under learn. This is my this is page. Baby, and yeah. This is my baby. Um, so here's the understanding soil health and watershed function. That will yeah. take you to a Google form to fill yeah. out. This one, um, that, and then the downloads right there. Yep. Um, this is um, a field methods guide, another free PDF that talks you through a lot of the different things that you would do to, to monitor for this. Um, so it's, and this was my first, um, so let's see, setting up a transect, uh, water infiltration, bulk density, et cetera. Um, this was my first project with the Soil Carbon Coalition was taking Peter's manual, which is brilliant and beautiful, but was not step by step because mm -hmm. I was trying to learn how to monitor. And I was like, I kept getting out there and I'd be like, oh, I don't have the right tool. You know, yeah, I forgot yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. So I took I, I just followed him around and <laughs> I, I <did laughs> made it. these lists, made these lists. And and so checklists and really explicit instructions. Mm -hmm. of you know for an observation hoop etc um and so that so that's uh something that you can download mm -hmm. to in and it'll give it a lot of the a lot of what you need in order in terms of um being Excellent. able to yeah. to do that and there's now there's a longer there's a couple longer versions of that yeah that, that have more of peter's front matter to it and i think he's rewriting those right now but um and then there's also there is also um uh, some information about the atlas that that you could read before you do it, including there's some of Peter's great drawings, but including oh, let's see, there used to be several videos. We just got a new website, so yeah. Um, but anyway, there there are some there are some there are some webinars about about it that will probably be back up there soon. Is there okay, a, is so there, is there a YouTube channel for so, uh, for Soil Carbon um, Coalition? Or not? No, not no. not yet. Yeah, um, yeah. that's cool. Sorry, I didn't my, check you. My YouTube channel, though, is worth mentioning. There are several um, of Walter Yena's videos from our seminar last year yep. that are um, really worth watching. They're long, but they're, they're worth watching. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Um, that was a great tool. And, um, and, and so then the timing, see, the timings go right into the... Yeah, gotcha. Right into the form, so you don't have to write down, keep track of how long it took to do that. Mm -hmm. And then there's things like, you know, principles, uh, evidence of soil health, which is just a set of questions. You know, what's the evidence that the mm -hmm. ground stays covered? What's the evidence, mm -hmm. this and that? Um, and we can create a new form. So if you have, if there's a group of people that want to do a little uh, kind of citizen science research project or a group yeah. of farmers who want to track something, yeah, um, great way to keep your data somewhere so it's not like a, in your basement when it floods, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, soil, your soil samples, any of that. Um, I love this one, um, yeah. you know, nutrient density of foods. We're hoping that people will start really posting a lot of geolocated data about. Um, you yeah, know, that's something that's really important to be done, I think, and but also to be done using methods which are really simple. And there's going to yeah. be more of that stuff come along with. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, so what we're so we're so we're okay a, with whatever. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say I just got a question on Facebook. Any thoughts oh, yeah. on on an examples of computer games for regenerative agriculture? I don't know of any. Not that I'm a gamer. Uh, <laughs> it's, okay, I'll tell you a funny story. So, <laughs> so I've gotten sort of semi addicted to this really stupid um, phone game, which is the only thing like this in my life. But some of my son's friends were doing it. it's called hq mm -hmm. and it's a it's like a, a trivia game mm -hmm. that then you split a pot of money you know if you win and and i and peter's got he is like a knows so much history and this and that and he has a very different set of knowledge than i have so so i when he's here i'm always telling him come on come on we gotta play together because we're gonna win tonight <laughs> And he gets terribly annoyed. The announcer is super annoying, and Peter gets annoyed easily by annoying people. <laughs> <laughs> but he just said to me the other day, he said, "You know, I can't stop thinking about that game. I think that we could that there's something to it. There's a principle there because you're because everybody's playing live at the same time, and you see how many people answered right or wrong." Mm -hmm. He said, "I think we could do something like that on soil health and ecosystem function." 
Yeah, it's interesting. So anyway, so so stay tuned. I don't know. There may be a game soon. <laughs> well, I, I um, have a couple of anecdotes there myself. Um, I um, one night, I don't know, I was working late, and I got this. Um, you know, hey, on Facebook, you get these invitations to play a game or something like that. Mm-hmm. I got one from Elaine Ingham. Oh. <laughs> and Elaine, Elaine um, at the time, and I, I, I had a laugh with her about it when I caught up with her. She must have been playing Farmville. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and the funniest thing was, which I took a screenshot of because it was so hilarious, that um, Elaine wants to buy more fertiliser. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... <laughs> But, uh, um, I'm, I'll, I, have a, I'll, I have a call with her on Friday. I'll have to give her a little chat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I uh, was working with a crowd in Scotland years ago and um, uh, with the, uh, I can't remember their name now, but anyway, a big crowd. And they, they'd spent 300,000 euros on developing a game um, to help fund the restoration of the Carpathian Mountains in Romania, which is they call the Amazon of Europe. And um, and it was a game very much like this. Um, the way they made money with it was, or the, the way that they raised money was that you, as you went up each level, you got an item of clothing, um, which was co So you had to buy that item of clothing. And so with yeah. your purchase, but it was playing on the fact, the very true fact that, um, that uh, there's an inordinate amount of hours that are spent by people playing games mm-hmm. and, um, and they, they are largely wasted hours and uh, you would say, um, I don't know about HQ, of course, it sounds like a riveting <laughs> use of time. But, um, but notwithstanding, there's a lot of people out there that could um, very much benefit from that increase in knowledge um, and playing that. Um, I'll just get back to, back to track. Um, you've got uh, Walter coming up soon. So you've got the tour coming up. Can you, have you got anything you can show us as far as dates are concerned and whatnot? So yeah. So um, on my, on my website, let's see, um, ddpursehouse.com, there is, I've created a page specifically for that tour. Mm-hmm. So at the top of that, uh, let's see, where are we? Um, That's actually that's one of that's that's a gathering where I was teaching about how to teach how to run a support group at in mm-hmm. Kansas at Gail Fuller's. Um, okay, so so events um, the soil carbon sponge seminar. So that that's got sort of its own tab there, mm-hmm. and um, we've got starting in California uh, oh, an event in L.A. and then one in Santa Barbara. The L.A. one I think is just an invite only lunch thing, but yeah. Um, and then uh, Ventura Marin. County, Marin, um, with Diana Donlin. Uh, this is Susan Cosino, one of your agrarians. Yep, 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 <laughs> yep, great. Um, she's, put it, she's putting that one on. Um, oh, and then we go to Kansas to Gail Fuller's. Um, and no, I'm already a part of that community. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that's Walter and Judy. Uh, Schwartz are going to be yeah. there and yeah. Walter's doing a third day uh, a farm design course um, oh, on wow. the third day so that'll be fun because he's he's got a million designs and ideas in his head huh. uh, wicking heads and all kinds of fun stuff mm. um, and um, and then uh, we have in Massachusetts those are actually scattered because we'll be going back and forth to there mm-hmm. uh, there's a, there's an event at Harvard that's not on here um, mm-hmm. And then in, in Ohio, there's a two-day seminar um, with Walter and Peter Bain, who's a mm-hmm. permaculture teacher. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then we've got our big event here in Vermont, which is um, four days uh, with Walter and me and a couple others teaching, but it's very participatory. The day, day four is actually a consensus workshop uh, to mm-hmm. think about how, what are we going to do next. Wow. And then following right on the heels of that um, Peter Donovan and Kat Buxton, who's our newest board member, um, are teaching how to use the Atlas, how to do monitoring. Um, so very hands-on outdoor on a farm workshop um, that, that we're hoping that some people will go all the way through from the 8th all the way through to the 13th. Fantastic. Yeah. And so uh, numbers are looking okay because it's coming up pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And we're good with, I mean, we're, we're also 
good with small groups because we love to go really deep. So yeah, what happened yeah. last year, we had 30 most of the days um, during this basically similar event last year. And there has been so much activity that came out of everybody who went to that workshop. Um, big coalitions are forming, lots of projects, lots of grant writing, lots of discussion groups. Uh, so so that that's that's a perfect outcome for me. I don't need hundreds of people. I want people who are committed to yeah, yeah. to really learning deep and then and then turning around and using it right away. So yeah. that was exactly what happened last year because we were able to have those discussions. So it's not just lecture, you know. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. The little no, lecture yeah. and then we do breakout groups and lunch top topic tables and yeah. Fantastic. Well, it's so it's so great to. Um, uh, we'll meet you in this way. Uh, it'd be great to meet you in person, and yeah. to um, and to hear your voice um, being added to those that are around. Um, the voices have been pretty well the same voices for a while, so it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear some relatively new ones come along and um, yeah. and have you join us today. So thank you. I know there's a few other points that we didn't get to today, but we'll have another opportunity in a few yes, weeks. We will. Uh, which I'm very excited about, and um, and please anyone who's interested in this topic, uh, follow uh, Dee Dee's work, uh, follow her book, um, The uh, Ecology of Care. Uh, it's a brilliant piece. I um, really can't recommend that to you highly enough. It's a yeah, it's a very very nice read, and you're a really great writer. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and also to your soil health work and principles that you've got going there with the Soil Carbon Coalition. Yeah. And did I, miss, did I miss anything else there? No, I'll just throw out there just um, because I know this will be aired again, um, that we have, we have for the next few weeks, we have an offer of a matching grant for $5,000 um, that in terms of supporting the next version of the soil health, understanding soil health and watershed function oh, manual. So that's through the so, Soil Carbon Coalition. So through the Soil Carbon Coalition, uh, uh, one of our very original funders, has said that he'll match up to five thousand dollars worth okay. of donation, and and it's hidden because Peter doesn't like to take money. But <laughs> <laughs> but if you go to the soilcarboncoalition.org and scroll down, down at the bottom, there's a donate button there. Yeah, okay. And All so, right. or you can just send me a check. So. <laughs> yeah, good. All right, very good. So yeah. send the Soil Carbon Coalition a check at your address, which we'll post later. Sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, it's been so wonderful to meet you and talk to you. Um, it's been a lot of fun and we've had a good amount of laughs. Um, yes, we have. Yeah, and I look forward to um, having the next lot of laughs and chat in a few weeks. Yes, we'll be so. Yeah, Walter's a lot of fun as well. So yeah, good. Yeah, we'll I'll, I'll get, good I gather yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, thank you to everyone who's um, spent the time with us today and on this uh, Agrarian's Talk session. Uh, as always, this will be available immediately after Thanks to our friends at Facebook and their large buildings which store data somewhere. <laughs> um, so in the meantime, um, soak it up like a sponge. And, um, and uh, in the words of uh, Brock Dolman, um, spread it. Uh, oh, God, spread I'm, it, soak it, think it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I, was, I thought I was going to be smart then, but I couldn't remember. <laughs> but yes, thank you, Brock. But thank you, Dee, for your time today. It's been really wonderful. Thanks. Great to meet you. Same. All right. Enjoy your day. You too. Hooray, everyone. <laughs>